Well, good morning, Calvary. My name is Jay Ewing. I'm a pastor here on the Erie campus, and it's so good to be with you. If you're new, we're, we are in the book of 1 Corinthians, so let's get out our own Bibles. We gave some Bibles away. Let's get our own Bibles out, jump into the conversation that Paul has been having from chapter 3 of 1 Corinthians. You, if you have a pew Bible in front of you, it's on page uh, 1,133. Fire up those iPads. Get out those phones. It's not a time to check fantasy football, people. We are in a great conversation that Paul is having. In fact, our chapter headings do not do us a favor here because there's not one argument to the next. This is a giant conversation in chapters 3 and 4 of 1 Corinthians, and that's where we're going to land. If you haven't listened to chapter 3, you haven't, you missed last week in that conversation in chapter 3, you need to go to calvarybible.com and catch up. Get into this conversation we're going to have in these two chapters, which is going to set us up for chapter 5 in two weeks. And parents in the room, got to warn you, it's PG-13 in chapter 5. So plan accordingly if it's appropriate for your kids to listen to that message in two weeks. But here in chapter 4, we're going to jump in. So let's read it. This is how one should regard us. As servants of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. Moreover, it is required of stewards that they be found faithful. But with me, it is a very small thing that I should be judged by you or by any human court. In fact, I, don't, I do not even judge myself. For I am not aware of anything against myself. But I am not thereby acquitted. It is the Lord who judges me. Therefore, do not pronounce judgment before the time, before the Lord comes, who will bring to light the things now hidden in darkness and will disclose the purposes of the heart. Then each one will receive his commendation from God. I have applied all things to myself and Apollos for your benefit, brothers, that you may learn by us not to go beyond what is written, that none of you may be puffed up in favor of one against another. For you see anything different? For who sees anything different in you? What do you have that you did not receive? If then you received it, why do you boast as if you did not receive it? Already you have all you want. Already you've become rich. Without us, you become kings. And would that and would that you did reign, and so that we might share this rule with you. For I think that God has exhibited us apostles as least of all, like men sentenced to death, because we have become a spectacle to the world, to angels and men. And we are fools for Christ's sake, but you are wise. We are weak, but you are strong. We are held in honor, but you in disrepute. To the present hour we hunger and thirst. We are poorly dressed and buffeted and homeless. And we labor, working with our own hands. When revile, we bless. When persecuted, we endure. When slander, we entreat. We have become and still are like the scum of the world, the refuse of all things. Paul's laying a conversation that's really important for the Corinthian church. They've let culture sort of seep in to the realities of their church. It's not unfamiliar territories. We can have that happen to us as well. Paul warns them that they need to be on guard. They need to consider their actions. They need to be people that are set apart and different. Yet, yet they have let the culture norms of the day dictate how they view each other. And this morning, I want to talk about a few questions and answer a few questions. The first one is, how does Paul want to be remembered? How does Paul, the apostle, the least of the apostles, want to be remembered? I want to ask, whose opinion do you care about the most? Whose opinion do you care about the most? What opinions dictated your choices this morning? Maybe your choices yesterday or your choices this week. What opinions have you heard that have influenced your identity? Because Paul, 
has an identity rooted in what chapter 3 ends in. That all is in Christ, and Christ is in God. So who, does, who do we boast? We boast in Jesus Christ. That's all we can boast. And Paul's picking up that argument and saying, listen, 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 listen. The reality is, if you profess your faith in Jesus Christ, if you have made him the Lord of your life, then all you would ever want, all you would ever desire, all that you would ever need is found in Jesus Christ. That's it. That's all you need. That's all you want. Everything you would ever desire in this human life, in this journey, is found in Jesus Christ. And the Corinthians have forgotten that. They have been persuaded to find their identity in others. Where do we find our influence in our identity? It's so hard, right? I mean, I'm in the stage of parenting where I, I really would like my kids to, in society, be on their best behavior, right? I care what you think about my kids. I care about your opinions. What do we think about the opinions of our coworkers that they have of us? What are the opinions that we think about our neighbors? I mean, does really everyone want a green lawn? There's rabbits in Erie, Colorado, people. We fight them all the time. What opinions really, really matter to us? Because those opinions shape our identity. Now in Corinth, Paul is addressing identity crisis in chapters 3 and 4. He's laying the groundwork to really have a hard conversation in chapter 5. The Sunday mornings, people have gathered in the local church and wrapped their identities in who's the preacher? Apollos, Cephas, Paul, the shorter bald guy, the taller bald guy. They've wrapped their identities in who they follow, who they claim. Now, in Corinth, they had this really unique perspective. Their identities were through proximity. I know that's an ancient thought. That's sort of sarcasm there. We do the same. We have our identities through proximity. I mean, I could tell you right now that Michael Jordan is the greatest basketball player of all time. And then your opinion of me would change or increase, depending if you're over 40 or not. <laughs> Paul wants Corinth to know that their identification with who they follow benefits only the message in which they bring. And that message is Christ. In chapter 3, it is all in Christ. Now in chapter 4, we're going to read in these first few verses. This is how one should regard us, as servants of Christ and stewards of the mystery of God. Moreover, it is required of stewards that they be found faithful. Paul's saying, because he's emotionally intelligent, he says this, here's the right view of who I am. This is how you should treat me. I'm a servant of Christ, and I'm a steward of the mysteries of God. I'm a servant and a steward. Now, Paul has said he's a servant in a lot of other different letters. In fact, it's one of his highest identification that he is least among who he's with. And he also understands that he is a steward given responsibility to usher in to usher in the mysteries of God now the corinth the people of corinth should view paul and christian leaders after him in two ways christian leaders are servants we're servants I mean, have you ever been to a church that you pull up and the nicest parking spot is for the senior pastor? I mean, that'd be nice sometimes. I'm not going to lie. Where does the person that you follow park? That's a simple. Are they the will most willing to grab a broom, to move some chairs, to consider your interests above their own? 
Who are you following? Who do you hold up on a pedestal? Paul says they need to be a servant. Paul also says they need to be a steward. Paul uses this analogy to describe church leaders as stewards and leaders handling essential mysteries. What are those mysteries? We love a good mystery. The mysteries refer to God's redemptive grace, which is kept hidden for a long time, but eventually revealed in Jesus Christ. God's task with church leaders was sharing the vision of the revelation of Jesus Christ. The death, the burial, the resurrection. The mysteries of God. Ooh, who could comprehend those? Paul says, stewards need to usher them in. Now, one of the things about a steward is they're held in responsibility. Stewards are there to give an account. Paul doesn't want the evaluation of him by the people of Corinth to be any other than servants and stewards. Paul's identification, his identity is grounded in the true reality that Jesus Christ has called him and redeemed him for the purpose that he could never possibly imagine himself. In verse 2, let's jump back in. It says, moreover, it is required of stewards that they be found faithful. Paul's opinion about himself is rooted in Christ and his call in his life. He's a servant. He's a steward. And all he needs and wants and desires is to be found faithful to that task. Now, he goes on. He says, you want to evaluate me? Paul's proper perspective of his identity lets him see the evaluation of others doesn't matter. Jump into chapter, uh, verse 3, he says, But with me is a very small thing that I should be judged by you or by any human court. Paul's being transparent with the church. He's been with them for 18 months before, before he sends this letter. He says, listen, 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 listen. I don't want you to evaluate me on that. I want you to evaluate me on Jesus Christ. Let's pause here. I did use sarcasm earlier in this message just a few minutes ago, but I dislike sarcasm a lot. It is not a spiritual gift that some may consider it to be. In fact, I grew up in a household where we didn't use sarcasm. And so when I left the household, I was so taken aback by cultures that use sarcasm so well, so poignantly. And here in God's holy word, Paul says, your evaluation of me? Let me use some sarcasm. Verse 7, for you see anything different in you? What do you have that you do not receive? If then you received it, why did you boast if you did not receive it? Already you have all you want. You hear the tone of voice. Already you have become rich. Without us, you've become kings. And would that you did reign so that you might share the rule with you? We might share the rule with you? For I think that God has exhibited us as apostles as last of all. Here's the reality. He's to be considered last of all. Like men sentenced to death. Because we have become a spectacle to the world, to angels and to men. We are fools for Christ's sake, but you are wise. We are weak, but you are strong. You are held in honor, but we in disrepute. To the present hour, to the moment he is penning this letter, he is hungry and thirsty, poorly dressed, buffeted, and homeless. And we will labor, working with our own hands, we're reviled. We bless. When persecuted, we endure. When slandered, we entreat. And we become and are still like the scum of the world. Paul is using hyperbolic speech here that he's genuinely everything the Corinthians do not want in a pastor. Someone who looks homeless, who's destitute, someone who's hungry and thirsty, someone who's a spectacle. 
And he says, this is the reality of this. Your evaluation of me doesn't matter. Your evaluation doesn't. I'm sentenced to death. I'm a fool. I'm weak. I'm desperate. Just reputed, I'm hungry, I'm thirsty, I'm poorly dressed, I'm homeless, I'm reviled, I'm persecuted, slandered, and I'm the scum of the world. Therefore, evaluating the Corinth church, the evaluation of the Corinth church towards Paul, means very little to him. So, the question has to be asked Does the evaluation of others matter? Do the evaluation of others matter to us? Do we care what our neighbors think? Do we care what our boss thinks? Do we care what our friends think of us? Do we hide? Do we look rich? Do we look like we are wise? Paul, Paul says, don't worry about those things. The evaluation of others doesn't matter. Paul wasn't worried about his identity because it was rooted, it was rooted in Christ. It's the connection back to chapter 3. It's all in all. I also want to make a connection from last week's message. This is why it's so important to be here on the Sunday. Because Thomas brought about the Sermon on the Mount last week in this passage, chapter 3. And I can't help but think that Jesus would tell his followers, the way of the kingdom, the ushering of, in of the kingdom, and his most famous sermon, that don't, don't be alarmed if this happens. In Matthew 5, he says, Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you, and others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you, or falsely say on my account. Listen to Jesus' words. They're in red letters. Rejoice and be glad. For your reward is great in heaven. For so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Paul understands that if you play out his identity in Christ, this persecution might happen. It's going to happen. Jesus promises those who are in Christ, those who desire righteousness, those who live a different lifestyle than those around us, will look foolish to the world. In fact, it might even make you scum of the world. And, as Matthew documented in Jesus' words, great is your reward in heaven. Because in the same way, this is what they've done all along to these people. If you should be treated poorly for your faith in Jesus Christ, you shouldn't be surprised. Because they treated Jesus himself that way. And when we look foolish to the world, giving up our time, our resources, our treasures, opening up our homes, associating with people that are in totally different social economic classes, we look like foolishness to the world. But our identity is in Christ. And that's what Christ looked like. Paul's proper perspective on his, his own identity, let him see the evaluation of yourself doesn't matter. In, chapter, in verse 3, he says, I should be judged by you or by any human court. In fact, I don't even judge myself. Paul's like, it doesn't even matter to me. I don't want to be, that doesn't, I'm not going to take myself seriously. Is Paul not aware of his shortcomings? I'm sure he is. Is he not aware of his mistakes? I'm sure he is. But he says, don't judge he doesn't judge himself. It doesn't help. It doesn't help. It leads to nothing. I'm not aware of anything of myself, he says in verse 4. But I am not therefore acquitted. He says, there is someone who will judge, but it's not me. See, Paul has a vision for a life greater than he could possibly ever imagine for himself. And that is in chapter 3, end of chapter go up with me to verse 21 through 22 and 23 so let no one boast for all things are yours life or death of the present or future will are all yours and you are in christ and christ is in god 
Paul's vision of what he gets from being in Christ fades his opinion of himself. It's not that he actually thinks about himself less. He can't even see himself because he is looking at Christ. He is gazing upon something that is far greater, that weighs far greater than any of his attention can imagine about himself. What's your opinion of yourself? Only the vision of Christ dissolves any other gaze we can have. And a generation that has such negative self-talk and self-image, and a generation in the 21st century that has these loops playing in our head, Paul says, I don't even judge myself. Those loops don't even matter to me. Because I am not even focused on those loops. I am focused on Jesus Christ. What vision do I have that is greater than myself? For Paul, it was Christ. This doesn't mean Paul does not care about anyone else's opinion. Paul's proper perspective on his his identity lets him see the evaluation of the Lord is the only thing that matters. Pick up with it in verse 5. Therefore, do not pronounce what it is the Lord. Sorry, verse 4. It is the Lord who judges me. Therefore, do not pronounce judgment before the time, before the Lord comes, who will bring the light, the dark, the light, the things now hidden in darkness, and will disclose the purposes of the heart. Then each one will receive his accommodation from the Lord. What is the evaluation that Paul is mattering most to him? It's God's. Because why? It says, because the Lord judges the heart now there's an ancient story found in your old testament happens in first samuel in first samuel we pick up this prophet named samuel that's sort of self-explanatory first and second samuel pick up samuel's writings and his story now samuel was commissioned by god to anoint kings and the first king that samuel anointed was this king named saul And Saul was tall, bald, dark, and handsome in his (laughs) mid-40s. Maybe with a slight dad bod. No, he was gorgeous. He was a man taller than anyone else of his time. He had it all together. And Israel said, that will be our king. He looks good. He must be good. He ended up being a really bad king. He ended up being a really bad king. And one day God calls Samuel and says, it's time for me to anoint the proper and right king. And I need you to go to this little obscure town named Bethlehem. And there you're going to go to the house of Jesse. And that day Samuel showed up to the house of Jesse. The first son walks in and he looks great. First child, first child looks great. Represents his family really well. And Samuel says this, Surely the Lord's anointed is before me. But the Lord said to Samuel, Do not look on his appearance or the height or of his stature, because I have rejected him. For the Lord does not see, the Lord sees not as man sees. Man looks on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. The Lord looks at the heart. Who then will judge Paul? The Lord. Right here. If it is the Lord who judges me, therefore do not pronounce judgment before the time, before the Lord comes. He's been talking about this in chapter 3. In verse 13 of 3, he says, For the day will be disclosed. He has the returning of the Lord as his identity. It has his marker for his engine for what he needs to tell the people of Corinth to do. And we're reminded on that day that these three things will happen. He will bring the light to things now hidden in darkness. He will disclose the purposes of the heart. And then each one will receive his commendation from God himself. Paul understands what the true reality is. 
He's living out of his proper identity. He knows that everything that he's done, everything that people do, will be exposed to the light. This is so comforting to the life of the believer. When we watch news cycles and see stories of wicked, evil people succeeding in life. When we have the misfortune of those who have conjured and swindled their way to the top. And Paul says, no, 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 no. That day, that day, everything gets exposed. Everything gets exposed. He discloses the purposes of their hearts. Only the Lord can do that. Only the Lord can judge your heart. Only He knows exactly the thoughts and the mind that you have had. Paul says, that's that's whose evaluation matters to me. He's the one who will praise. Not you, people of Corinth. Not you, people of Calvary. It's the Lord. It's the Lord. Now, Paul's desire is not for approval of men or even himself, but is to have the opinion to be found faithful. Jump up with verse 1 and 2 again. This is how one should regard us as servants of Christ and stewards of the mystery of God. Catch this in verse 2. Moreover, it is required of stewards that they be found faithful. Faithful. That's all he wants. You to see him in the proper light. Someone who has been called by God to be faithful. What will God call you? What will he call me? Are we faithful to the little things? Are we servants and stewards of what God has laid before us? Are we servants and stewards of Calvary Kids? Making sure that each classroom has a believer in it that loves them and wants to know their names and teach them the scriptures? Are we servants and stewards of hanging out with middle schoolers? Opening up 1 Corinthians with them. That's what they're studying this morning. Will we be found faithful as we hang out with them tonight in middle school ministry in Mayhem? We'll be found faithful to our high school ministry. Will we be found faithful to meeting together on the weekday and being known and knowing others in a life group? Are we servants and stewards of what God has done in women's ministry? Momco on Thursday morning Bible study? Are we servants and stewards to men's ministry, making sure they're flourishing? Are we servants and stewards? Will we be found faithful in using our resources in the proper light for our neighbors, in our neighborhoods, for disciple-making around the world? For Paul, for Paul, he knew the day of the Lord was going to come. And for him, He wanted to be found faithful. Now, that's where we're going to stop the text for today and pick up the remainder next week in chapter 4. I do have four pastoral observations I want to give to you today. Four pastoral observations from what Paul was doing in Corinth. First and foremost, center your identity in Christ. Center your identity in Christ. Now, how does one do that? One opens up the scriptures and reads about Christ. One examines Christ. One studies Christ. One prays to Christ. One sings to Christ. One gets in a community that points them to Christ. Center your identity in Christ. Because in chapter 3, of First Corinthians, Paul reminds us all of uh, all the things we would ever desire is in Christ. Every spiritual blessing, as Ephesians one says, every spiritual blessing that Christ holds, we hold.
Every spiritual blessing. So often we are so focused on the little things that we don't realize the big things in which we have. And those are fulfilled and found in Christ, in Christ alone. The opinions of others matter very little. Second pastoral observation. The opinions of others matter very little. When you're looking at Christ, nothing persuades you. Nothing will tempt you away from living in another opinion. Third, this is really important in our generation. Negative self-talk and self-evaluation fades quickly when we look at Christ. You want to become a whole human being? You want to have your life and freedom and joy and peace? Look at Christ. Look at Christ. Finally, because I love you. Because I love you. Judgment is coming. Judgment is coming. Be found faithful. Do not be like the pagans who eat and drink and say, tomorrow we will die. No, be found faithful. Jesus is coming. Lord willing, he's coming back today. But he's coming. Be found faithful. All right. Let's wrap this thing up. Let me pray for you. And I'm excited for you to step back into the conversation of chapter 4 next week. And remind yourselves that chapter 5 is coming. And it is very, very harsh. Let's pray. Lord, I'm grateful. I'm grateful to be around the people of God this morning. I'm so grateful for the work of Christ, the redemptive work of Jesus Christ, loving me, dying for me, saving me. And Jesus, may we be found faithful as the people of God. Calvary Bible Church, may we be found faithful as servants and stewards of the Lord Jesus Christ. And Jesus, deepen our commitment. Help us recommit to centering our life and our gaze, our vision on you. And Jesus Christ, may you today show us ways and places that we can step into serving and being stewards of this wonderful mystery, which is you, Jesus Christ, taking on flesh becoming man and saving us. And Jesus Christ, may you receive all glory and honor. May you be the one that is famous. May you be the glorious one that we uphold. And it's in your name, Jesus, we pray. Amen.